Interested in selling your house, but unsure of where to start, what to do, and who to talk to? Looking to maximize the appeal of your house? Looking to increase your exposure and sell your house for as high as you can? This video will break down all the steps a homeowner should take prior and maybe during selling their house to ensure maximum potential of an ideal selling price. Obviously, there are more things to do for a homeowner when they're selling a detached, semi-detached, or townhouse when compared to a condo where there aren't as many items to do, but this video is still relevant for condo owners as well. Please thumbs up the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm in my thick boy t-shirt with my thick beard. I'm midway through my real estate series. I'm probably going to be going back to stocks and investing in a couple weeks, so if you have any other topics you'd like covered about real estate, let me know soon. Preparing your home for sale. It is absolutely critical to make the best first impression you can to win over potential buyers. Preparing your home for sale would include a number of different things depending on the type of house you're selling. If you have a front yard and a backyard, obviously do some landscaping, either hire a company or do it yourself to increase your curb appeal. Make sure your grass is green, no yellow spots, pull out any weeds, mow your lawn, and remove any branches or leaves. You want people to feel excited and feel good about the house as soon as they arrive before even entering to see the interior. Once they're inside, if your unit is vacant, you might want to think about staging. If your unit is vacant and you left it with no furniture, it's hard for people to see where everything will go. How big are the rooms? Where does the couch go? Where does the TV fit? A lot of rooms, when they're completely empty, they seem much smaller than they actually are. Staging is very necessary for a vacant unit. Otherwise, like an empty room, an empty house, it doesn't feel very inviting. Staging is not always necessary. If you currently live in the unit and you have nice furniture and a good setup, it might not be as important. If your unit is fully occupied and you have all the furniture, if you have nice and I guess clean looking furniture, hire a cleaning company, do a deep clean and declutter the entire house. It's not necessary to hire a staging company and then throw all your furniture in a storage locker for a couple weeks or a couple months while you sell your house, unless your furniture is like decrepit or your cat scratched up your couch. Well, what if your house isn't that pretty and it doesn't have the best curb appeal? You have the option of renovating to increase your curb appeal to make the house a little nicer and potentially get more back than you invested in these renovations. You don't always need to go overboard on spending. You don't need to renovate the entire house. Choose one or two important items and make the most out of it. A new coat of paint probably goes the furthest in my mind. What if you're selling an older house and you realize it has knob and tube wiring? This will make it very difficult for new homeowners to want to purchase your unit because they won't get insurance. Knob and tube wiring is a very high risk fire hazard. So if you were going to do any renovation and you have knob and tube wiring, that is one system I would upgrade. I would upgrade to more modern wiring. Timing the sale. Timing is everything. Sometimes you can't control it. I understand. If you got a new job, it's out of town and you have to move ASAP, I get it. Things happen. But if you can control it, if you're not in a rush, try to time it perfectly. Everyone knows the springtime is the best time to list your property, with the fall being the second best. Keep in mind, sales fall off a cliff in December and January, so try to wait till at least March if you can. Obviously, March and April is when the supply is highest because everyone is trying to sell at the same time. But keep in mind, it's also when demand is highest. Many of my clients try to buy a unit in March, April, and May to ideally get a June, July, or August closing. They want their kids to finish their school year and move in the summer so they can start fresh, brand new in a brand new school instead of moving halfway through. Getting a home inspection. I know what you're thinking. When I bought this house, I paid for a home inspection. Shouldn't the buyer be getting the home inspection? Not this time. You, as the seller, will be getting a pre-listing home inspection. There are two benefits of doing this. The first being you'll find out of any unknown or hidden issues in advance and you have time to fix them. This is better than the buyer putting an offer on a property, you accepting, then they do a home inspection and they realize there are a lot of issues they don't want to deal with and then they either negotiate the price down very drastically or they pull out of the deal altogether, which they have every right to do. The second benefit of a seller getting a pre-listing home inspection is having every buyer remove one condition from their offer. Every offer is usually conditional on financing or inspection. Now, since you've provided them with a pre-listing home inspection, they can remove that condition. Now, hopefully you'll only have offers with the financing condition. 
Now, obviously this doesn't apply for any condo owners. So if you are selling a condo, I will change this step to pre-order your status certificate. Many offers on a condo will include financing and a status review. So for you ordering this in advance, you can send it to every prospective buyer so they can have a look at it and either offer knowing the status certificate is good or not offer at all and not waste anyone's time because they've reviewed and they're not okay with the whatever the status certificate says. Determining price. This is probably the most complicated step. It varies the most. Different houses have different pricing strategies, same with different neighborhoods. So which strategy are we gonna take? Is it a buyer's market, a seller's market? Do you think it's relatively balanced? Should we list the unit low to attract more offers? But how low is too low? Should we skip the multiple offer scenario and just list it at the price we want? We know what the condo next door sold for, so why don't we list it at the same amount? It's the same unit, same building sold two weeks ago. Let's list that. If that unit sold for 800,000, let's list for 800,000 as well. What if we price it too high? Will we discourage potential buyers from even viewing the property because it was too expensive for them to begin with? Pricing multi-million dollar homes is a sensitive issue. There aren't that many comparables to look at and there, it's not as likely that you'll get a multiple offer scenario because there aren't that many buyers in that range. You won't get it won't be as easy to sell as a smaller cookie cutter condo where everyone can afford it, everyone's looking for it, or houses priced in a cheaper community. The best place to start is to analyze similar properties that have sold in your area. This is super easy for condos. For 400 or 500 units in a building, you'll have no problem pricing your unit. Add a few thousand if you're on a higher floor, add 7,000 if you have a locker, maybe take off 50,000 if you don't have a parking spot. Pricing for a condo shouldn't be an issue. What I found in downtown Toronto, at least, is to list low and set an offer date seven to eight, seven to ten days away and let the buyers bid against each other. Here's an example of a unit I sold last year in downtown Toronto with certain information hidden for obvious reasons. I listed it below market value. We were aiming for at least $800,000. That was our target. So we set up an offer date. We ended up getting a little more than what we expected, which was great. A house is a little more difficult to price if there aren't that many comparable units that sold in the area. I could probably talk about 10 different strategies, but what I would do is find a house that sold recently and see if they have, let's say, a double garage where you have a single garage. Yours would have decreased value in comparison to theirs. If you have a finished basement, whereas the other unit had an unfinished basement, that would add value to yours. There's just more to consider when pricing a house, but the best thing you could do is try to price it correctly from the beginning. You don't want to go back and start adjusting the prices because you'll show desperation and you would have, show, and you would have shown your hand already. You won't have as much bargaining power when people can see and they can tell that your unit isn't selling. Here is a perfect example. I let this one get out of hand. My client was convinced, convinced his unit was worth 985000 this was the biggest mistake I've ever made. I let the client dictate when he clearly didn't know what he was talking about. We listed at 985,000 and got zero interest, less than zero interest. He thought I wasn't marketing enough, but people need to understand. I could spend thousands in marketing, but no one will pay more for a semi-detached house than a detached house did next door. This strategy was doomed right from the get-go. We ended up doing three price reductions Everyone sensed we were desperate and we were throwing, we were getting thrown insanely low offers. This is exactly what I would have done. Look at the final selling price. This was $150,000 less than what my client was expecting. It was my fault for letting it get to this point. We should have never listed so high. We needed to sell since the client was buying another property and we needed the funds for that down payment. We probably lost $50,000 due to this poor pricing strategy marketing this step has changed a lot over the past few years over 90 percent of buyers search for their units search for their new houses online the most obvious and most popular place in canada is mls a website where everything listed by a broker is listed here people don't look at flyers and print media anymore that used to fly in the past in my experience it just doesn't work anymore it's just wasted money and wasted effort Everything should be online these days. Maybe the only physical thing should be a sign on the front lawn. So people driving by might see it and might come by for a visit, but not many. If it's a condo, obviously a physical sign isn't even possible. What about open houses? What sellers need to realize is that nobody sells their house 
based on who showed up in an open house. If you look at the community, if you look at the people who come in, it's usually nosy neighbors from the community just looking at your house for fun, or it's people selling in the area and they're doing market research. They're coming to see what your house looks like on the inside so they can properly price theirs. They're gonna be waiting to see what yours sells for so they can have a better expectation of what their unit will sell for. It's very rare that someone comes in off the street and buys a house that they showed up at an open house for. Open houses, get this, are is advertising for realtors. What I do is I have coffee and snacks at my open houses. When people come in off the streets, uh, they're, they're forced to stay a little bit, they're eating, they're drinking, and I chat them up a little bit. Most people are looking for houses. They came into this house, they say it's out of their range, and then I find out they don't have a realtor. So then I give them my business card, and now I have them as a client looking for other units, not trying to sell the unit I'm doing an open house for. Offers. This is the final step. If you're a homeowner, I'm assuming you've already done this before, assuming your house wasn't inherited or you moved in with a spouse who already had it previously. Ideally, you get a firm offer. This means no conditions. It means they're good for financing and they're 100% committed to the purchase. If someone submits a firm offer and you accept, they don't have recourse from backing out of their deal without losing the deposit. The other type of offer is conditional. This means they are buying this house on the condition that they get approved for financing. This is fine, a lot of offers are conditional, but what sellers need to know is that the buyer can back out at any moment without waiving their conditions and they don't have to give you a reason. If you've sold your house conditionally, don't get too excited until those conditions are waived. The buyer can still back out at any moment. Once their conditions are waived, it means the deal is firm and they're committed to purchasing the house. If you're lucky enough to get multiple offers, take all your firm offers, put them in one pile. These are your strong offers. Take your conditional offers, put them in another pile. These are weak, these are flimsy offers. It might be higher, but remember that they can, they can pull out at any time without giving you a reason. And they, they have every right to do so. It's, it's in the offer, it's conditional. If someone submits a conditional offer, $100,000 more than a firm offer, this might not mean it's the best one to choose. What if the bank doesn't appraise your house for that $100,000 more? They won't get financing and they'll pull out the deal. Now you have to put the house back on the market, maybe have another offer date. Maybe the people who were initially putting those firm offers found something else and now you're out of luck. I would obviously focus heavily on the firm offers. These are your strong ones. These are the people that are committed. If one offer, let's say you have five firm offers, if one is clearly way above the rest, I would work with that one. If there are two firm offers and they're really close to each other, let's say five or $10,000 difference, obviously you'd want to let them know so you can give buyers to a, a be, put buyers in a better position to offer slightly more so they can get their house. What if they were looking for a negotiation? What if they offered 850,000 but their max is 870? If you let them know that two offers are very similar, they can come back with a stronger offer. They can come back with their max, let's say 870. What I want sellers to take away from this is not to be deceiving. If you set up an offer date and in the listing you say highest bidder wins, one round only, if everyone submits their best offer, don't turn around and say everyone's rejected, everyone come back with a better offer. You already stated highest bidder wins. So what if people don't like that you're being deceiving, you, weren't being, you, you are being deceiving, you weren't being truthful. What if everyone walks away? Then you have no offers and you're left with your pants down. If you state in your listing, hey everyone, offers are listed Friday, submit by 7 p.m. No bidding war, highest offer wins, no games. Make sure to stick to your word. Boom, that was easy, now your house is sold. I find selling a house is a lot easier than buying. You don't have to drive to 40 different houses, maybe 40 different neighborhoods looking for the ideal unit. Let's say you find the ideal unit and then someone else comes purchase it from under you. Let me know if I missed anything. I'll be sticking to real estate for the next few videos, maybe the next few weeks. It's, it's an important topic. Everyone thinks they're an expert until it actually comes down to buying and selling. So I'm glad you're here doing your initial research on the topic. My next two videos will most likely be the pros and cons of FSBO, for sale by owner. And my personal favorite, I'll be settling the rent versus buy in Canada debate. Should I rent or should I buy? Will I make more money by investing in the stock market and renting? Or will I make more money by buying a house? I can't wait to read the comments on that video. See you guys. Thank you.